Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom, sponsored by Greenway Dodge. Bottled water has become the norm, but one local expert says draining the water from Florida springs and aquifers is taking a toll. Coming up, he'll explain what can be done before it's too late. Thanks for joining us. I am Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Before we get to that conversation, I'm going to answer your questions like I always do. This is called Talk to Tom for a reason, because it's a chance for us to talk to you, the viewer at home. Find out what you're interested in and answer your questions questions. If you would like to submit a question to us at any time, just go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Our first question today comes to us from our friend, Victoria French. Victoria writes, first, I love watching you and all of the Channel 16. Thank you, Victoria. Second, is the following true or myth? And she writes, it's always the coldest before the dawn. If that's true, why does this happen? Okay, Victoria, I think you're confusing um, sayings or folklore. Normally, I think people say it's always darkest before the dawn. And that darkest before the dawn is absolutely true. It gets dark, 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 dark. Then all of a sudden, you start heading toward sunrise, pre-dawn, and then dawn. And so it's darkest before the dawn, which is a way to encourage people to keep up the good fight keep slugging away. Things don't look good now. Things look bleak, but it's always really bleak before it starts to get better. You always hit bottom before you can come back up. All that stuff. Darkest before the dawn, not coldest. Now, normally we have what we call a diurnal effect. Um, during the day we warm up and then the sun starts to set low and temperature drops. And so it's kind of like a you know, up and down, up and down. And sometimes it is cold right before the sun comes up, but more often than not, it's right after the sun comes up that we're at our coldest because they have a little lag time there. The temperature's dropping, 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 the sun comes up, it's dawn, and then 20 or 30 minutes later, or the next hour, we start to rebound. It takes time for the sun to heat the earth and the earth to release the heat and for us to start to warm up. Now, if you step from the shade into the sunshine, well, that's immediate, you do feel it, but that doesn't mean that the temperature the ambient temperature outside has warmed up at all. So darkest before the dawn, not always coldest before the dawn. Sometimes the temperature actually goes up overnight. We had a case recently where we had cl a cloud deck overnight. The wind shifted from the east southeast and the temperature actually rose. Between midnight and 6 a.m. we went up like three or four degrees. Happens a lot. So it is not always coldest before the dawn, but darkest before the dawn. All right, next question. Our friend Andrea asked, what causes it to be cloudy but not rain some days? Okay, Andrea, we can have cloud deck and nothing to trigger the rain. In order to get the rain going, it's kind of like baking a cake. You have to have all the right elements. You have to have moisture. You have to have some lift or a triggering action normally to make it rain. So what happens here in Central Florida? We've talked a lot about the sea breezes colliding. And we oh, didn't mean to hit my microphone. We've talked a lot about the sea breezes colliding and the lift that causes condensation and that produces rain. We also get cold fronts coming through this time of year. We have our warm, moist air mass in place and then a cold front comes through, produces the scattered showers. And recently we had a situation where we had the cold snap and then to warm it back up, the warm air has to come back in from the south to the southeast. And as the warm air overrides the cold air, we again have a mixing layer or a convergence layer and we get rain then. So it can be really cloudy and not rain easily if you don't have something to trigger that moisture. So there you go. It can be cloudy and not rain. Happens quite often. Our friend Lee writes to us, obviously from Seminole County. He wants to know why is it that Lake Monroe and Sanford can sometimes be flat like glass and other times choppy like the ocean. Okay, Lee, here's the deal. Anytime you're looking at uh, a body of water, the wave action is largely a function of the wind. So the waves are going to be built on how much wind we have. How fast is that wind blowing? How long has that wind been blowing? And how long has it been over the water blowing that strong? In other words, what we call the fetch, the distance of open water that the wind has had to blow over to produce waves. And so if you get a place like Lake Monroe, all of a sudden it gets really choppy. Um, so if there's not a storm close by, if there's not a prevailing wind, if it's a calm wind day, when winds are a mile per hour or two miles per hour or calm, 
drifting. You're not going to have any wave action at all on a body of water the size of Lake Monroe. If all of a sudden we have a hurricane going and the wind is coming in from the northeast, the hurricanes off our coast and the wind coming in as it rotates around, comes in from the northeast or the north, the big wave action piles up against the coast there in Sanford and does all kinds of crazy damage and the waves can get really tall. Three, four, five feet maybe. Big, big waves curling in, looking nasty. Looks really, really rough. Um, you get that a lot in the Great Lakes too. Some days you go out there and it looks glassy. Some days there's a storm in the, on the Great Lakes and you get the big waves pounding the shoreline. All right, let's talk to our friend, let's see, Rick Grimes. Rick, oh, hey, Rick, yeah. Rick is asking about my early days as a DJ. He wants to know the kind of music we played. I think Rick must be a big Facebook fan because this was part of the um, National DJ Day. I posted a picture of me as a 19-year-old Bowie and my radio station I worked out in Portland, Tennessee, WMRL. Um, the owner's name was, uh, hold on, Slim Williamson was his name and his wife's name was Merle. And so he named it WMRL, kind of like when I buy this place, it's going to be WTOM. So the um, WMRL was a little radio station in Portland, Tennessee. The kind of music I played varied depending on which station I was working at. But right there at WMRL, I started playing adult contemporary. Slim Son had been in charge of the radio station, and he had kind of changed the station to adult contemporary or top 40. And uh, it was languishing and not doing well. And so when I first started there for about a month, I was playing uh, top 40 music on Sunday afternoons. And then um, I started working Saturday and Sunday. And then Slim took over the station as the head of the family. He came back to run the station. And when he took over, he changed everything to country music. So this is in the 80s when the supergroup Alabama was big. Merle Haggard, George Jones, George Street. This predates Garth Brooks, uh, but it does not predate George Strait. And so I played a lot of country music and a lot of religious music on Sunday mornings and a lot of religious programming. That was it. That was kind of it. I did radio for, let's see, 1981, 82, 83, 85. By 1986, I was done with that kind of radio and landed my first TV gig. And from there, things kind of took off. So in direct answer to your question, top 40, or country music, that was about my limit. And then onward and upward in television. All right, thank you so much for your questions. I appreciate your time. If you would like to submit a question to our program, please log on to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Send me your questions. I'd love to know what you want to know about here in Central Florida. And please stick around. We'll talk about how all that bottled water we're drinking and shipping out is draining the Florida aquifer. All right, welcome back. Bottled water may taste better than what's coming out of your pipe here in Florida, but a local expert says it is bad for our aquifer. Jim Adamski, geology professor at Valencia College, joins us to talk a little bit more about that. Hi, Jim. Welcome to Talk to Tom. This is your first time on with us, is it not? That, that is correct. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> That's awesome. We do all kinds of scientific conversations and talks here, and I really appreciate you showing up. Hey, first of all, let, let's, let's talk about um, where all this really begins. Why does Florida's water taste so bad coming out of the tap? A lot of people don't like it. I can drink the water at my house, but I do filter it. Why is it so bad? Well, I mean, I guess it's a personal uh, preference. Um, I don't mind the taste of the water. Or maybe I, after 27 years, I've just gotten used to it. Uh, we did have some relatives come in here uh, over the holidays and complaining about the taste of our water. Um, it all comes down to the chemistry of the water and also the plumbing to a certain extent, too. If you've got some, you know, rusty old iron pipes, you know, it's going to impart some, some obnoxious taste to the water. Right. I I've done water tasting competitions with... Um the water districts before, and there's a definite difference in water from different parts of Florida. I don't have a big problem with it, but I grew up in middle Tennessee where you could get a hold of sulfur water. And so once you've grown up <laughs> drinking really bad water, Florida water is not too bad, not to me anyway. I do filter it, but it doesn't bother me. All right, let's talk about where the water 
uh, used for the bottled water is being pumped from? Where is that? What aquifer are we killing? Okay, um, yeah, it all comes down from what we call the Floridan Aquifer System, mm -hmm. which is a very deep uh, aquifer that's in the limestone that underlies most of Florida. And this water has been down there, uh, some of it has been down there for literally thousands of years. And so uh, we are using it at a much, 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 much faster rate than nature can replenish it. You know, we always talk about renewable and non-renewable resources. But it usually comes down to, are we using it at a rate that is sustainable? Are we using it at a rate that's, you know, that nature can restore? Mm -hmm. And in the case of our water, in the case of our aquifers, we're using it at a much faster rate. And uh, for those who don't really understand or know, why is that important? What, what does the aquifer do for all of us that taking too much water uh, well, out of it is a problem? Yeah, well, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, that's where 90 plus percent of our drinking water comes from. So mm -hmm. from a human health perspective, from our just daily day to day lives, that's really important that we sustain this aquifer, that we don't use it at a faster rate. It also is very important for the environment of Florida. Uh, the springs like Wakawa Springs near my house, Blue Springs, uh, Silver Springs, they all come from the same aquifer. And if we use the water at a faster rate than it's being replenished, then ultimately what we are seeing through our research is that the spring uh, discharge is declining at these springs. Oh, wow. And another problem, talking about like the taste of the water, uh, when you withdraw the fresh water from the aquifer, especially mm -hmm. if you're more toward the coastal areas in eastern Orange County or uh, toward Tampa area, then what happens is the, the fresh water gets replaced by what we call saltwater intrusion. And so over time, the aquifer gets saltier and saltier until it becomes non-potable. Wow. Can that be reversed? I mean, what do we have to do? When That's very difficult to reverse. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, if we just deplete the aquifer, if we were to kind of turn off the taps or turn them down or something like that, then eventually the aquifer would recover. As far as the saltwater intrusion goes, that's a mm -hmm. lot more complicated issue. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, how close are we? Are we at a, at a tipping point with that, with our aquifer right now? Well, it depends upon what you call a tipping point. I'm mm -hmm. on the board of a group called Friends of the Wakaiba River, in addition to being a professor. Yeah. And we've done some studies and um, the state, uh, the water management district in particular, St. John's River Water Management District, has what they call minimum flows and levels for um, springs and for rivers. In other words, they don't want to see the discharge of these springs and rivers go before, below a certain level before it starts harming the environment. And for Wakawa Springs, we've seen it drop uh, or be below that level 60% of the time in the last 20 years. And Rock Springs, it's been below that level about 33% of the time. Uh, and, you know, people might say, well, this is an environmental issue. This doesn't necessarily affect me. I don't, you know, I, I don't go to the springs. But the fact of the matter is those springs are not only important for the environment, they're actually important for our, our local economy. Uh, tourism brings in a lot of money in Florida and some of that tourism, a good deal of that tourism is to visit places like Wakawa Springs and Blue Springs. Yeah, I love them both. I've been to both. They're fabulous. They're fantastic. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that they're suffering that much. So um, when it comes to the drinking water is it is it better for us to drink from the tap and if so why i drink from the tap um and you know again you know there's the issue of the bottled water and by the by, way the bottled water is coming out of the same aquifer right. if they're coming from the, the same place right? from. i wonder if they're coming from the same place uh, drinking my tap water versus buying my bottled water becomes six of one half does the other then doesn't it or what am i supposed to do uh, well, you know, I mean, a lot of that bottled water is being shipped out of mm -hmm. state to other right. parts of the country. And so, you know, if we're if we're if they were only bottling it for residents of Florida, then maybe we wouldn't see that right. much of a change <laughs> in the withdrawal. But yeah. the fact of the matter is a lot of it is going out of state. And there was a recent study that just got published. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember what journal it was published in, but uh, they just found that, you know, every bottle of water contains like thousands of pieces of microplastics <laughs> right so you're drinking them <laughs> right it'll be interesting and, to see if that study is uh, confirmed by uh subsequent studies but um but yeah yeah okay so that that also they talk about in your food you have so much plastic in your food so much plastic in your water so um does tap water not have any plastic in it or you think it does too 
Because it shouldn't. Right. It shouldn't. OK. And in central Florida. Yeah, it, it definitely shouldn't. You don't want microplastics in your drinking water. And uh, the water coming out of the aquifer generally is pretty good quality. Uh, I've worked on this aquifer for 27 years. I've studied it, studied the water quality of it, studied, you know, the microbiology of it. And for the most part, uh, with few few exceptions, it's a very high quality um, you know, I wouldn't go to the spring and drink directly from the spring. That's oh, yeah. never a good idea. Um, but the water down there, again, some of it's been down there for decades, centuries, even thousands of years, depending upon what part of the aquifer you're in. Okay. So, you know, the chances of microplastics getting down there are pretty, pretty small. Okay. I don't want to... Um... Are you able to like tell me who the companies are pumping it out? I don't want to go like you know become one of those. Uh, I, I don't want to start a, a cause here or a, a movement. And go oh no! Don't whatever you do, don't buy Desani or don't buy Zephyr Hills. Or don't buy their water. They're pumping up. I don't want to mess them up. Um, I don't want to cause a protest. But how many different bottling companies that we drink every day are pumping our stuff? Well, I, uh, Nestle has a big bottling plant here in the state. Mm -hmm. um, to be totally honest that's outside of my area of expertise i just right. study the aquifer and mm -hmm. the f factors affecting it um in you know and just to put it in perspective um you know nestle i believe is pumping about a million gallons a day uh but uh orange county alone pumps about 250 million gallons per day oh wow so somebody might argue that nestle is a small you know part of that overall withdrawal but, you know, somebody else, I'm, you know, in my opinion, it's maybe a smaller part, but it's still a part. It's kind of a death of a thousand cuts. Really and is. so, and that, that is a part that maybe uh, doesn't need to be. Well, let's talk so. about, we've got about a minute and a half left here and we're, we're running up against it. But I'd like to ask one more question about like, um, some of my neighbors have a well that they water their lawn with. I never put a well in. I use the, the water that comes through, that I pay for coming from the county. Um, but really, back to the, my point of six of one, half dozen the other, if they're using a well and I'm paying for my water, it's still coming from the same aquifer, correct? Uh, it depends. Um, if their well is relatively shallow, it could be mm -hmm. coming from what we call the unconsolidated aquifer or the sufficial aquifer. Okay. Um, that's a much shallower aquifer that they could be using. Uh, generally, you don't want to use it for drinking purposes. The quality is not there um but it's fine for watering your lawn or for your oh. garden but so that, that eventually that water environmentally is still that is in a, a way thing, it is um okay. but in a way it's still connected i mean hydrologically they're still connected the two aquifers mm -hmm. so if you take water out of one ultimately you're going to be affecting water in the other that's what i was yeah trying to get to we're, we're all we're all burning it up we need to find a way to Maybe be more it's, like Arizona, <laughs> have rock yards, yeah. have so much grass, so much plants. Hey, I'd love to keep talking to you, but we're running out of time. We've got to do the uh, other stuff and wrap it up. I appreciate you. That is Jim Adamski from Valencia. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate your time. Hopefully we don't run our aquifer dry. We'll have you back on later if uh, we have more time to talk. Thank you so much for being on Talk to Tom. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you All for right. having me. And thank you for watching Talk to Tom. We appreciate you tuning in. Remember, you can always download this podcast anytime from wherever you listen to podcasts or watch Talk to Tom anytime on the new 6 Plus app. See ya.